uh, thank you for, uh, for inviting me and for uh, um, you know, coming to this uh, event. Um, you know, I'm a big fan. I know Gregory probably stepped out, but I'm a big fan of uh, House of Cards. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen the show, you, sh you should watch it. Um, the the um, Frank Underwood, who, who eventually becomes the president, is, uh, is quite adept at, uh, at getting out of situations and uh, creating them and then getting out of them. And that seems to be what, what we end up doing in this business uh, all the time. Uh, you know, the pace of change is, is pretty incredible. Um, you know, today, uh, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to give you a very brief uh, overview of, of, of our company, what we do, uh, and then kind of walk you through uh, what we see uh, in, in the macro environment, what's, what's affecting our business and, and all of the places that we do business. And then uh, uh, towards the end, I will show you some of the things that we're doing to, to uh, uh, hopefully affect uh, change in, in our business and the way we deal with uh, some of the uh, challenges in, in the industry. Um, the other thing was uh, the, 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 the slide that, that we were given uh, as a, to start the presentation was uh, you know, sourcing in crisis. You know, we didn't, I didn't create that, uh, that and, and, and we don't actually believe that there's a crisis situation here. So um, let me get into that. So, uh, so this, this, this is the structure of, of, of Lee and Fung today. Um, as, as some of you will know, um, we're, we're by far the largest uh, uh, sourcing and, and trading company in the world today. Um, and the, the company is, uh, has a few different verticals. Uh, on the left, uh, when you see a Lee and Fung Limited, which is our trading and our logistics network, that is the, uh, the core of the business. And, and the, uh, so the Lee and Fung that you hear about is typically that uh, that business, and I'm, I'm on the board of that company along with uh, William Fung and Spencer Fung. Um, and then in the middle, you see a distribution network. This is a spin-off. We spun off part of our company uh, last year, and uh, this company is called the Global Brands Group, which is listed in July. It's also listed in Hong Kong. Um, the, the shareholding of that group is, is equal. The Fung's own 30% of, of Global Brands, and that's basically all of our licensed and branded businesses. It's a global business with the US, Europe, and, and part of Asia as part of that. And then on the right, you see the retailing uh, part of the, of the Fung Group. Uh, the Fungs have uh, many different interests in retail. There's a few publicly listed companies there. Uh, in totality, there's over 3,500 uh, points of sale, uh, and it's mainly Asian-focused. There's a few uh, you know, flagships. Uh, London, they pretty much own Savile Row now. <laughs> Savile Row number one, number two, number three. Uh, and there's a few flagships in New York uh, and a couple in Paris, but for the most part, it's, a, it's an Asian-based uh, retail uh, um, situation. Um, so you're not going to be able to see a lot of the things on this slide, um, but the, it, it, the, the network that we have today, uh, as I mentioned, is, is by far the largest in the world. Uh, we have over 300 uh, offices and DCs throughout the throughout the globe, uh, and of course the concentration is 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 in Asia, uh, but we do business everywhere. Um, last year, in our uh, sourcing group, um, uh, we exported from 63 countries and we exported to uh, over 100 countries in the world. So it, it's truly a global uh, global business. Um, so crisis or opportunity? Uh, the future sourcing landscape um, is it really in crisis? We flatly said no. Uh, it, we don't think it's in crisis. Um, what we see, however, of course, is, is an incredibly complex environment that is changing uh, rapidly. Uh, you know, everything that uh, that that we that we read about, hear about, uh, is affecting us. Uh, it affects us in every which way. There's no place on earth where something doesn't affect our company and, of course, affects the industry. Uh, and, and what we find, of course, is there's, there's an incredible amount of disruption going on, uh, which, of course, affects our customers, affects the consumers, and affects how we uh, attempt to deal with all of that. Um, so if we think about the arena of sourcing, you know, what, what really affects our business today, um, if you look at the, you know, the circles around the, uh, uh, the middle, uh, the, the two that are highlighted in, in light blue, the demographics of the consumer and the changing face of retail, these are obviously uh, massive changes going on that are affecting the consumers and, and our customers. Uh, all of the other 
uh, uh, circles are really the things that affect uh, the sourcing uh, markets, the speed to market, trade labor issues, uh, the demographics of the countries of production, uh, wages, currencies, raw material prices, uh, political stability, and of course uh, social and economic stability in the countries that we uh, operate in. So all of these have, have massive influence on, on where we do business. Um, when we look at uh, you know, the, 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 the macro type of economic uh, uh, things that affect our business, <coughs> Uh, we typically look at, uh, at these indicators. Um, I'll skip the top one until last. So uh, crude oil. I mean, you know, the changes in oil that have affected us ha has been dramatic. If you see the, the dotted line that goes across, that was the predictor of, of where the oil was going to be, uh, you know, going into the next three years. And then, of course, you see the huge drop of, of, of oil, which has happened. And, you know, in many ways that uh, we, I think we all think that's a good thing. But in many ways, it's not necessarily a good thing, because uh, it affects a lot of businesses in different ways. Uh, and then, of course, you have to adjust to that. I think if you're a, uh, a customer who's trying to um, you know, procure goods, uh, of course, the drop in oil is, is, a, is a big benefit in terms of, of course, your logistics costs and, and also in the cost of goods sold. Um, and then if you look at the cotton index, uh, you know, one of the key uh, indicators in our business on the apparel side of the business um, you know, the cotton has, uh, we had a huge blip, uh, you know, a few years back, which really created a huge crisis in the industry. Uh, you know, today it's, 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 on, a, it's on a slide down, uh, and, and we, we, we see that continually um, not coming back in, in any which way uh, over the next few years. And then you see the CPIs of the, of the developed world and the developing world, uh, you know, very, very slow growth in the developed countries, uh, if any. And, uh, and uh, in the developing countries, of course, the CPI is much higher, uh, which is uh, you know, bringing on the, cons the new consumers into our markets. At the top you know, is the, is the, uh, uh, the RMB uh, rate you know, versus sort of the US dollar. And, and here, you know, there's this two, um, this, uh, some of the bankers in the room will probably tell me what they think, um, but there's, there's two schools of thought here, you know, what's going to happen with the RMB. Um, and uh, I'm not going to tell you what we're predicting, but um, you know, it, 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 it was obviously going in, a, in, a, in a, an appreciation against the dollar for, for quite a long time. But given all the changes and the things that are happening in China, there are, uh, you know, part of the uh, top economists think that it could go the other way. And that, I think, would have a dramatic effect uh, on, on the businesses and the countries that we do business in. So we're going to have to watch that very, very closely. <coughs> So let's put some of this in context. You know, when, when people uh, read about, you know, the, the incredible inflation in, in wages uh, in, uh, in mostly in, in, in Asia, but in, in the developing countries, you know, they focus on the, on the wage rate. And, uh, and, and of course, there's been dramatic changes, as you can see on this slide. Uh, you know, this is from 2010 to 2014. Uh, these are hugely inflational, inflationary numbers. You know, Vietnam over 100%, Bangladesh over 60%, et cetera. But when we look at, um, at uh, minimum wage movement, uh, you have to take into consideration uh, also you know, the currency factor. Uh, and of course, recently, there's been a dramatic change with the dollar becoming so strong. And so if, if you look at this, the appreciation, there's only a few currencies that have appreciated against the dollar uh, in the last uh, you know, three or four years, but most have actually devalued. And that, and that devaluation, we believe, is going to continue because the dollar uh, is clearly uh, on, a, on a strong path. So when you put the two together, um, you get what we call you know, real, real wage inflation. And uh, so, so the numbers are somewhat muted. Uh, and if you look at the numbers, there's still a lot of inflation, obviously, uh, you know, in totality from the labor side. But the currency has actually helped. Uh, and in some cases, it's actually made it cheaper. I mean, in, we do a lot of business in, in, in Istanbul and Turkey in that area. You know, huge changes there, so things have gotten cheaper. Um, and in India also, which had a big currency depreciation, uh, things have mitigated. So th there's a lot of other factors you have to look at as you look at total, uh, total wage uh, inflation. Um, now some other areas. Um, when we look at, you know, where we do business and, and for our customers, uh, you know, there's, there's an incredible amount of disruption that goes on, it seems like, all the time. Um, I've listed a few here, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Vietnam. 
Um, you get to go to Egypt, you can just keep going. I mean, th there's, there's things that happen, the coup in, in Thailand, you know. Uh, uh, th you know, these things keep happening, and it's just a fact of life. I mean, those of us, I've been doing this over 30 years, unfortunately, um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's like everywhere we turn, there's something else. And I think one of the, the effects of that, of course, is, is, is not being stuck in one place. I mean, I'd say probably five years ago, a lot of companies woke up and they realized they were only in China, you know, and, uh, and, and that's, that's not a good feeling. Uh, you know, and of course they saw the incredible uh, changes there with the increases in costs, and so they started to panic. And, uh, you know, we've been a global company for a long time, so we've been very diversified, and we've encouraged our customers not to be, you know, uh, pigeonholed in, in a few areas. But the, 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 when, when things do happen, and they inevitably will and continue to happen, uh, you know, we, we try to provide flexibility in, into the process so that you're not stuck in, in, in one area. And, you know, probably Bangladesh is the most obvious uh, 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 issue right now because, it, you know, it's become, uh, you know, one of the top exporting countries in the world uh, in, in apparel. And, uh, and the, the issues there um, uh, presently are, are, are pretty dramatic. I mean, first you have the incredible disasters in Bangladesh uh, with the, with the uh, collapse of... Uh, of the uh, factory buildings and, and the fires, the Rana Plaza uh, issue. So, so you had a huge disruption in the industry. And then, uh, you know, now you have a lot of political issues there, um, incredible issues. But what, one, one thing that's pretty amazing is that, you know, through all of this stuff, uh, the supply chain continues to operate. And, uh, you know, we, we may not encourage uh, customers or people to visit, you know, in these times of, of stress, but. Uh, our, our, our factories, our vendors, our people, the supply chains continue to, to operate uh, incredibly smoothly given all the challenges. So um, even when things happen overtly, uh, there's still ways to do business. Um, you know, I, I'd say this is, let me keep, I think this is fairly obvious, but, uh, uh, you know, typically when you look at, um, you know, countries that are, uh, higher, higher wage, uh, you know, more developed, uh, the risk factors are lower. Uh, and then when you get into the bottom of the pyramid, uh, you, know, you, you, you enter a much higher risk uh, um, environment. Uh, and if, if you see um, you know, the big circle there, um, that's uh, China is ranked 64th you know, in, uh, uh, on the curve of all, of all the countries. You know, we believe that China is, is an incredibly uh, stable environment you know, to do business. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's maintaining uh, its uh, position uh, in, in global uh, uh, procurement. And, uh, and I, we believe that it'll happen and stay that way for a long time. Uh, but, but as I said, the other countries that are low on the totem pole bring different risks. And I think as, uh, as customers, brands, retailers you know, assess those risks, they, you know, they have to be very, very careful about how they position themselves. And one of the things that we do, of course, is to try to protect their interests in uh, all the places that, that uh, we do business with them. Um, and and th this is more about that. So obviously, the, you know, the issues that they look at are brand damage, investor alienation, you know, potential loss. So, so the, the, the cost of doing business uh, uh, and just chasing the cheapest price for, you know, for, for, for products is not always uh, uh, the smartest uh, approach. You have to be very diversified. Um, so let's take a look at, at, at some of the top countries of, uh, of export. We, we've, we've, we've split it up between uh, the U.S. market in apparel and the EU uh, in apparel. And you can see some, some obviously dramatic uh, differences here. If you look at the top 10 exporting countries uh, to the U.S. in apparel um, between uh, uh, 12 and 13, we don't have the 14 numbers yet officially out there, but 14 very much followed the same path, I can tell you. Um, in, in, so in the top 10 for the U.S. in apparel, every single country basically held its own or, or increased. And so the total export, uh, you know, was up about 3.7%. Uh, you know, the EU is a dramatically different number. Uh, and I'm sure you realize the EU in totality is bigger than the U.S. market. And so this, this has had a big, big impact on uh, on, on many, many of our suppliers and, and the countries that we, uh, you know, export from. And so you can see, a, you know, a dramatic drop from every country, even, even places like Bangladesh, which are clearly, uh, you know, more inexpensive. Uh, there's been a, a, ma a major drop. 17.5% is huge. 
So, so the European uh, uh, crisis, in, in essence, has affected all of these uh, developing markets, and, uh, and, and it's one of the reasons why actually prices have stayed down, because the demand is, is, is just not there. Okay, so let's take a look at what we're looking at here. Uh, you know, when we look out, we, we look out where we, our company's been around for 108 years, and uh, as Victor says, we're just beginning. Uh, you know, they're looking at the next 100 years, and uh, this is a, a, a you know, a, a very um, futuristic-looking uh, 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 company, and uh, the, the fourth generation of the family is in there now, and it's going to keep going. And so we, we, we do a lot of thinking about the future. And when, when you know, and we're sitting here in Asia, uh, you know, as a, as a Hong Kong-based uh, conglomerate, and, uh, and, and, and basically, as, as, as Gregory showed on his, on his uh, slide, you know, we're, we're, we're so close to really where the world's population is. And, and frankly, as a company, we, we haven't taken advantage in many ways of what's happening around us, because uh, the focus is, is usually on, on the U.S. and European uh, markets. So there's, there's 7 billion people in the world today. Only a billion of those are in the developed countries. Six billion, uh, of course, are uh, you know, in the developing countries, the emerging markets. And the total disposable income is $40 trillion. So there's a lot of money being spent every day. And, uh, and, and where that uh, disposable income is moving to is, is, is pretty obvious. Um, so when we look at the total apparel market and, and where, that's, where that's growing or it's not growing, and, and you can see the, you know, the separation on the slide here, yeah, you know, if you look at the traditional markets, the growth is, is anemic, zero to two percent. Uh, you know, in the U.S., the apparel growth is coming just from China. You know, it's a massive number. So, while a lot of people, of course, have gone into China, haven't made money in China, trying to figure out China, I think the, the ultimate, uh, uh, you know, answer is you have to figure it out, otherwise you're not going to be part of the, of the growth story of, of, uh, of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think the other thing is that where our traditional customers are so uh, focused on their own markets, the, you know, the U.S. and Europe, and they, and, and they look at their supply chains and they think about the vendors that, are, that, that they're doing business with, their business partners and procuring their goods. I think what many don't understand is that what's coming from the undeveloped markets, from these bricks and from other people, the numbers and the, and the, uh, the volume is so much bigger than, than we've experienced. And so it's going to be a tsunami in many ways, and it's going to disrupt the way uh, these traditional supply chains work uh, as these things gain momentum. Uh, you know, the U.S. won't be the big buyer anymore, uh, you know, things like that. And so the, the focus has to change somewhat to understand why you need to be important to your, uh, to your suppliers and vice versa. And we call it the integrated supply chain. It's becoming a very much cohesive uh, approach to, to doing business these days. Um, you know, the other thing that, uh, that we're focused on is, uh, is, is, the, is the incredible change in demographics. You know, when we look at the, uh, at the developed countries and even China to some extent, uh, you know, the, the populations are older, uh, you know, the developed countries grow slower, and uh, so the, the boomers, of course, are getting older, uh, and, and, and the way they spend money and the way they consume is very different. Um, and, and what we call the new juniors, the millennials, um, whatever you want to call them, um, you know, they're, they're more and more and more, you know, coming into our space. Um, you know, the figure here is six, 361,000 babies are born every day. Um, and if you combine just in the U.S., the, um, the, the, excuse me, the younger population, it's over 50 percent. Excuse me, I'm going to get some water. <coughs> Uh, so, you know, so what we see, of course, is that the millennials are changing the way that uh, business is done today. You know, it's, and it's pretty dramatic. Um, and, and, and this, you know, this change in the way they consume, the way they look at everything is, is completely different than, <clears throat> than the old. Right. I may not make it. Uh, excuse me. <coughs> Um, you know, the, the changes are dramatic, and I'll get into some of those here. <clears throat> uh, 
um, you know, when, when, when our customers are faced with, uh, with this disruption in their business, <clears throat> they, <clears throat> oh my gosh, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> they, um, you know, they're stressed uh, because they don't know what to do. You know, basically, they're faced with, you know, this disruption in uh, PR retailers, Army Channel, <clears throat> um, you know, lots of different things. And basically, it, they're, because they're stressed, we become stressed. And uh, in that environment, <clears throat> they're looking for direction. They're looking for change. They're looking for people to help them. Uh, you know, get through this 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 disruptive, um, you know, time. Gosh. <clears throat> uh, let me keep going. <clears throat> so there's two things you know going on between the two uh, areas. If you look at the supplier side, um, it, you see all of the things that are affecting um, you know the business of our suppliers wage inflation, uh, lead time issues, <coughs> uh, smaller order quantities, uh, the move to fashion, uh, you know, increasing uh, regulatory environment. Uh, you know, it, it's what it's basically is more and more complexity going into the business. And of course, you have a huge uh, issue with prices because the, you know, the consumers in the developed world are not spending more money. <clears throat> they're not willing to spend a uh, higher cost. The margins are going down, so the retailers and the brands are, are, you know, are squeezed on the margin side. And so you've got, you know, two dynamics going on. You've got uh, increasing, uh, you know, cost in the developing world and decreasing margins on the, on the uh, customer side. So it's a real issue, and people have to dramatically change the way they do business or they're not going to be in business, uh, you know, anymore. Um, you know, to highlight a few of these, you can see the, uh, you know, the major issues here. If you just think <coughs> about the changes just in the last few years with uh, companies like Zara and H&M, you know, the fast fashion retailers, and then you think about the online businesses, uh, you know, Amazon and Alibaba. <coughs> I mean, these are dramatic changes in a very, very short period of time. <coughs> So, and, and you know, it, and of course, it affects both the uh, the retailers, the brands, the low end, the middle, the high. It affects everybody in the industry, uh, and and you know, the stress there is, is is very very high because you have these disruptors coming into their market that they never had to deal with before. The issue with the online guys is, in many cases, they don't make any money. You know, they're coming into these markets, and they're, they're doing billions of dollars in sales, but they don't make any money. They're not measured the same way. The financial market measures them in a different way than, you know, than actually just normal profit. <coughs> so, what are we doing about it? Um, you know, at the top you see the customers, which are the brands and retailers, <coughs> and and down below are all the uh, all the vendors in the supply chain. And uh, so we've looked at uh, at two things. Um, Facing the facing the the the, the vendors, um, we've developed something called the VSS, which is Vendor Support Services. So, what we're what we're basically doing is saying, you know, what what are the what does the supply chain need to survive? <clears throat> what do they have to do to develop to stay competitive? So we've developed uh, a number of, uh, of things. We've been doing many of these things over the years, <clears throat> but uh, what, what we've done is we've formalized it. Uh, so we have uh, something called LF Credit, which is basically a financing uh, arm of the company uh, to help the vendors. Uh, VSC, Vendor Supply Chain, we're, we're getting into uh, helping the vendors understand productivity, you know, lean manufacturing, uh, <clears throat> doing a lot of... Uh, deep dive into how they do their business to help them. Uh, and then uh, vendor compliance and sustainability is really uh, making sure they understand the complexity of, of what the, uh, the, the customers need. 
and, and as we move, you know, even though China is maintained, for us today, China is about 50 percent of our total. We do about 21 billion in business today, and China is about half of that. Uh, but the, the and, and China's maintained, you know, its, its share in, in, in value, in dollar value, but it hasn't maintained its share in, in terms of uh, units. You know, things are moving, of course. And as things continue to move to other countries, uh, you know, we're trying to get ahead of it. We're looking into Myanmar, of course. We're already established there. We're looking into Africa. We're going ahead of the curve and trying to understand <clears throat> where things are moving, but also to make sure that the vendors don't make the mistakes of the past, like people like in Bangladesh. We want to get, make sure that the, the supply chain is going to be sustainable from day one. And so we're getting ahead of all those types of things. So that's one way we're looking at things. The second way is looking up at the, at the customers and saying, you know, what, what do they need to, to compete today? And so we've developed what we call CSI, which is uh, the Customer Service Initiatives. So really <clears throat> helping them uh, in a much more upfront way. Uh, some of it is in design and development type of things, you know, product development, the, uh, the formatting of, um, of uh, you know, 3D printing and things like that. We can, we can get into that out here. Uh, and help them, uh, you know, on prototypes and things like that. Uh, data analytics, we have a huge infrastructure in our company, both inside Lee and Fung Trading and, and in the Fung uh, Global Institute. So we're looking at a lot of, of ways to, to mine the data. We have a huge amount of information that comes to our company every day. Uh, <clears throat> then market intelligence, you know, trends, uh, uh, forecasting, and lots of other uh, information that typically they would rely on in the past uh, either other consulting companies or, uh, you know, or their own uh, people in, within their own companies. And uh, so because of our scale, uh, we actually have access to information that, that they can't get. Uh, so the combination of the two, we think, is going to help us uh, and help our customers, uh, you know, stay ahead. Um, so uh, uh, Gregory, you know, mentioned some of the, you know, Internet of Things and data analytics and all that type of stuff. You know, so we're experimenting a lot. You know, as I said, things have changed, they're uh, changing rapidly, and you think about all of the, 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 the things that affect your lives, it's, it's pretty dramatic. So we're also trying to stay ahead of the curve. We've been spending quite a bit of time uh, talking to people in Silicon Valley. Um, yeah, we have an uh, investment arm that looks at new technology that affects our space. We're investing in companies, uh, uh, not just in the U.S., in Europe and Asia. And uh, so we're, we're, we're doing uh, experiments in, in, in various areas. <clears throat> and uh, the S-Lab is, is one of those that we're trying to incorporate um, uh, different technologies that, uh, that can help our, our customers uh, pull it together. Things like uh, Centric, Optitex, uh, Fast, Fast Fit 360. These are technologies that are in, in our space, and we're, we're grouping them together uh, in order to uh, challenge the old way of, of doing business. And, uh, you know, we think that, that, that these uh, technology changes will continue to be very, very rapid, uh, and, and there's a need. Uh, if you don't do something, you're not going to, uh, you know, stay in the game. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've also created a lot of, uh, of, of technology uh, internally as well as externally. So we're facing both the uh, trying to find more efficient ways to do business, and that includes how we connect with the suppliers and how we connect with the, with the customers. Uh, you know, so, so we're, in effect, a, a, a portal, uh, uh, and, and we have you know, thousands of customers and over 15,000 suppliers coming into our networks, and so we're creating a lot of tools that really weren't around. I and mean, if you think about the sourcing business and supply chains, they're, they're, you know, it's kind of seat of your pants, run around, find a factory, make sure they produce the right thing at the right time, check the quality, make sure someone actually moves it on to a, uh, to a forwarder so they can ship the goods. If you're still doing that today, I think you're not going to be around for very long. You know, those are not the, uh, that's not the essential part of the business anymore. And I think the, uh, again, the, the rapidity of change and the need to stay ahead and to focus on what's coming uh, is extremely important. So while, you know, we could say in, in totality the sourcing environment is, is challenged, uh, which is very true, in, uh, and the changes are happening and will continue to happen and most likely faster, uh, I think at the end of the day, 
you know, we say unless there's a way to make things uh, virtually, <clears throat> at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if it's omni-channel, if it's a pure e-tailer, if it's mobile, if it's however the consumer is, is, is wanting to buy and purchase and get his goods and he picks it up at store, he picks it up, you know, at home, he gets delivery, it doesn't matter what, you know, essentially at the, beneath all of that, somebody has to make the products and the goods that they're wanting to buy. And so that still means at the end of the day, uh, you know, you need to have the sourcing and the supply chain, uh, you know, capabilities to, to, to supply the world whichever way they want. Uh, and unless 3D printing disrupts uh, that industry, um, you know, to a huge degree on, on a mass scale, I think uh, businesses like us and companies like ourselves will survive uh, for a long time. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you.